So I have once again the amazing Kerry Arthur with me today and we are going to talk about a very important topic which is cover books and design. So as you all know and I talk about it all the time, Kerry's amazing, I love it a bit and she has so much knowledge. She's been in the industry for 20 years now and she really knows the stuff. And we also have a feature guest today which is Kerry's magpie at the window which is an Australian <laughs> He's currently sitting at the moment because he wants to be fed. So we're going to smash through this interview and hopefully you guys <laughs> can take a lot from it. So thank you for joining me again, Kerry. Oh, thank you for having me yet again. <laughs> <laughs> so great that I've seen you here twice. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously having a cover is very important. It is basically, as they say, the first thing that any reader or any possible buyer is going to see and it needs one to explain what your book's about two it needs to be professional looking and three yes. it needs to scream out this is your book this yep. author this concept so i guess step one is actually having a concept of or a rough idea of what you want on your cover would you agree i think it's important to follow genre conventions Every genre has its own expectations, like urban fantasy. Urban fantasy is always a, a chick on the cover with a weapon of some kind. It's just, it's an expectation. Readers look at that cover and they go, ah, you know, hot chick, urban fantasy, you know, strong, strong female warrior. So, you know, and, and like cosy mysteries. Cozy mysteries have a definite cartoonish look to them at the moment. So readers look at them and think, okay, cozy mystery, that's my genre. So you've got to meet genre expectations as well as having a great colour. Because I think, too, because our books are our babies, uh, we, we find sentimental value perhaps in the cover designs that we want. But I know, and I would say especially for self-publishing authors, because... Traditionally published authors uh, usually have their cover outlaid already for them. I don't think... Yeah, they have no say. Yeah, <laughs> I was trying to be polite about it, but... but they yeah, no, you have no say. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas self-publishing, you're completely in control of it. So yeah. I think because we have that power, sometimes um, it can shoot us in the foot as well. Because if you haven't done your right research, then you might have... For example, I have had plenty of author friends on their first book. They've released a book. I was like, that's a nice, that's a nice cover. But it doesn't give away any of the story. I have yeah. no idea. And when I read, I was like, oh, it's dark fantasy, but you have light colours on the front and a really romantic looking font. Yes. And I would hope if you're writing a specific genre that that's the genre you would usually read. So like you said, if I see a cover, if I see a Carrie Arthur cover, I know that's what I want to read because that is what I read. I see, I see the kick-ass woman. I see the weapon. I'm like, yes, I'm going to pick yep. this book up and I'm going to read the blurb. So it is important to stay in market. And I know a lot of people haven't done that. And then in a year or two, they've changed the cover and they've seen their sales boom. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And I think another important, a lot of authors try and put a scene from the book on the cover and that doesn't work either. You know, you, you've, you've got to give the concept of the book, not so much what's actually in the book. So a kick-ass woman, it doesn't matter if, like, on my Blackbirds Rising book, she doesn't, she doesn't wear a corset with feathers around her neck, you know, but it gives the, the idea of what that story is about. She's a blackbird. She changes shape, you know, and you can see that in the, in the, on the cover. But, you know, it's got nothing to do with what's actually in the story. So I think that's important. Yes, 100%. And it needs to make the reader question straight away. The mm. only way you're going to pick up a book is if it intrigues you. If you have yes. a very straightforward or very cluttered, if you're trying to, and I've seen this before, people put too many elements onto a book cover. Yes. They try and get too much of the story in it. And I think it's yeah. not necessary because you should be able to, and it's dis difficult sometimes when you're writing a blurb, but you should be able to simplify what your story is about as well. And that is what the cover is. It needs to be inviting. Yeah. It needs yeah. to arouse question from the, from yeah. the reader. Yeah. It needs to hook the reader from the get-go. Your cover is your storefront. So, you know, you've got to treat it like that. 
if it's all, if there's too much information, people are just going to walk away from it. And that's why I think we should roll into the very, very, it's not controversial, but doing it yourself and hiring a professional to do your cover. Go. <laughs> <laughs> professional, professional. Unless you do it for a living, get a professional. You know, you can get buy some brilliant pre-maids out there. Uh, they're not expensive. You can get a brilliant pre-made for $90 or so, you know, and, and they look professional. You don't have to spend a lot of money to get a professional cover. Do it. Don't do it yourself. Uh, I will pr uh, say, though, some of the designers out there are not good. You know, some of them are still learning, uh, so pick and choose. Uh, but, yeah. Don't do it yourself unless it is actually your job. <laughs> so. And I know uh, a couple of people who they will go out, they'll purchase Photoshop and then they will start doing it. And I, I think it's, I always encourage people wanting to learn in the industry and learning new skills, but it does need to look professional and just be honest with yourself. If you don't have those skills, then then don't, don't do it because it, you're sabotaging yeah. yourself. You can be proud of your efforts but you're just not yet there and that's fine because yep. when you look at, when you go into a bookstore or when you look on Kindle and readers are scrolling through uh, books of that genre, yours will stick out as a sore thumb. People will know that it hasn't been professionally designed and you could have had the greatest editor working on that. You could have yep. the best story, but if your book isn't selling that it's professional and amazing, nobody's going to pick it up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, as I said, it's your, your shop front. And if it looks amateurish, then people are going to think the inside of the book is also done, being done by amateur and they're not going to pick it up. So, um, yeah. What do you think of, so I know for my, for example, for my first young adult um, series, they were designed and I love the covers and I was very uh, close to them, so to speak, but yep. they did offer a certain, and they weren't, they weren't bad, um, but yep. they definitely were for a more juvenile audience to say. So that did limit my sales in a sense as well, because yep. it didn't exactly scream out to a older genre and it was young adult, but I had so many people who were adults read this series and were pleasantly surprised that it had more elements to it than they thought they would. So yeah. I think, and then I changed the covers completely and it's changed my market completely as well. So yep. I think as we're talking about before, just be conscious of where your market is. Yes. Yeah. And the market you're aiming for. I mean, there's variations of young adults say, so do your research, check what's selling, check what the best selling authors in that genre are doing with their covers and, and don't copy, but you know, Look at the themes they're using and then try to do something as, along those lines to attract that market. What are your thoughts on authors who do change? Obviously, covers change. Um, yep. And that's great. They're trying to either go with the times or they just don't think that the cover that they've had for the last, you know, four years is expressing what the book's about. Yep. Um, I do, however, know that some authors perhaps change their covers too frequently. So it can be seen as a marketing, you know, where really diehard fans want the new cover every time. But I think that burns out very quickly as well. So what do you think about changing covers? Um, if the cover's not working, by all means change it. But don't do it as a marketing exercise. You'll see a lot of, there's certain sites out there that uh, promote changing your cover regularly to get to um, get into the Amazon algorithms. So if you change your cover, you get a boost in the Amazon algorithms. Um, yeah, so I don't agree with doing that because I, I just think that's bad business when it comes to readers. Um, but if, if your cover's not working, by all means change it. I will be changing one of my covers because... Um, I don't think the cover now matches with the other two. So I'm changing it because it's not matching the other two anymore, no, for no other reason. Um, but, you know, if you're just doing it to gain the system, then it's, I think, you, in the long run, you will pay for that. 
And I think this is a little bit off topic, but you're probably one of the first um, authors I've actually discussed this, well, about to discuss this with. But uh, being conscious of Amazon's algorithm is always important because you do want to do what's best for you and your book and be able to push it up in the ranks, obviously. Uh, I do know, and we've, how many years, you know, they change different things and people change different tactics and, you know, they hit number one because they've written about a big toe and they put it in health in a very, very specific niche market. And if that is not your book, if that is not your genre, do not do it. And the same goes with covers. Don't try and trick readers. Don't try and trick the system because you may get a best-selling label or a couple of extra sales, but you are being extremely dishonest to the audience. And Amazon's going to clue onto that very quickly as well. Yeah. Well, you look a lot at a lot of the authors who were gaining the system early on. You look at where they are now. They've got no career. You know, because you know, they've had, okay, they, they did well out of the system for the first couple of years and then they crashed because what they were doing was no longer working. And, and as you said, Amazon are always changing the game. Um, you just, it's not worth the hassle of trying to game the system to, and game Amazon. Play it honestly, play it straight and just write good books with good covers and, you know, you will have a long-term career. I'm glad we discussed that. Sorry, that was a bit off topic. But I was like, yes. No, no, um, it's fine. <laughs> how do we find a cover designer? Uh, there's lots of Facebook um, uh, pages that have multiple uh, designers, on, like Cover Design Marketplace, I think is one of them. So the marketplace has, you know, multiple. These, there has to be at least 50 designers on and that they've re- they're regularly posting pre-mades and stuff like that. So I, lo- I love going to uh, those sorts of places and I have bought multiple pre-mades off places like that. Um, and it's a good way of, you know, just if you see something like going to their website to see what else they do and um, things or, you know, say one of your mates has got a great cover going, asking them who did it and stuff like that. Yeah, so it's just a matter of following the market, seeing what designers out there, what they're doing, what you like, and, and then finding recommendation. There is a, um, there's now a Facebook page that uh, is doing um, uh, recommendations on uh cover designers so you know people go on and say i've had this cover uh this is my experience with the designer and it's it's really it's 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 not bitchy or anything like that but it's it's just an honest site you know they talk about the problems they've had with the designers and other people come on and say my my experience was completely different so that's a really good site and i can't remember it offhand i'll have to i'll have to send you the link (laughs) but it's a good honest site and yeah so yeah and that, and, that all, and that all falls into again making sure you're doing your research don't be scared yep. to ask people um yep. i'm curious so at the start a lot of my book covers they've all been specifically made uh so they're custom made um yep. and recently i've actually found myself looking on even google websites looking at pre-made covers looking at facebook recommendations and yep. The reason why I originally was going custom made, which is a lot more expensive, was because I had a lot of sentimental things that I wanted to put in the cover. I had a very yep. specific vision. Um, and sometimes because of the cover artist that I was with, there were certain things that we couldn't throw into it because, again, everyone has their limits of experience. Yes, yes. I'm not against pre-made covers now. I was never oh, against no. them. Yeah. But I'm curious, do you always go with pre-made covers? No, no, no. I started off with, you know, uh, getting covers designed for me. Most of all the Lizzie Grace series has been designed. I've, I switched mid-series and you can actually tell where I switched the cover designer uh, because I, I just wasn't liking the, the samples I was getting from one cover, so I, I switched. Um, and... Like Bike Bird Rising was a pre-made. I just saw it and fell in love and thought, oh, my God, that's, that's my story. So I bought that and I bought multiple others that are waiting for stories. Um, so I do a mix. I really do a mix. I started off with, um, 
you know, having a designer do it for me, but more and more I'm looking at pre-mades and thinking, wow. So, yeah, there's a lot of good ones out there. And you actually saying, I think in our previous interview, Blackbird, you actually saw the image and then the story started coming to you from that. Yeah, I had I had a vague idea for a King Arthur story, but I saw that cover and I thought, oh, my God, there's the story. And, you know, just the whole thing went boom in my head. So I had to buy that one. And I'm, I'm currently getting the second and third book covers done now. He's actually designing the other ones. So, yeah. So... So what do you think of, obviously, a lot of, um, when we're talking about custom covers, a lot of the photos that are on covers are stock photos. So basically, yes. they have a limit, say, 100,000 times they can be downloaded from a site, and anyone who has them can use them, which is yep. fine and great. But I do notice, especially in the romance industry, there's mm -hmm. a lot of double ups. So you can, obviously, the, the story is different. The font, the name, everything is different. They've just used the same photo. That scares me a little bit too, though, because I don't think at any point there should be any double ups of your cover or close to either. So what do you think about, you know, how do you make yours different, I guess, should I say, if you are using a stock photo in these situations? Um, if you're using a stock photo, you've got to be aware that, it will be out there. Like if you look at Lizzie, the cover of Lizzie Grace, that's a stock photo. Now it has been manipulated, but if you look close enough outside my book, there's that photo is everywhere. I've seen it at least six times, different situations, you know, different settings, stuff like that, but it's a stock photo. So you've got to be aware that you're not the only one using it, even if it, it's been manipulated. Um, but if you want, if you don't want to use stock photos, then you've got to pay extra for someone to do a complete design just for you. So, you know, it, it, it depends where you fall money wise. And I guess that'll take us on to the next question. Money. Uh, it's <laughs> yeah. always a factor in what we're getting done with our covers. So, you know, when are you paying too much or when are you paying too low? I know that I've looked at some pre-made covers and I've thought $500. And it's not that I'm being tight. It's just paying that amount of money. Unless it, I, I think maybe max for a custom cover if I have so many specific elements. And I understand that these are professional artists, but yeah, I yeah. prefer to have a relationship with my cover artist too. So I think that $500 for a cover is excessive considering I could be putting, I could pay $200 for a cover maybe and then put the rest into marketing or something. So what do you think is too high, too low, you know, sticking with your budget? What do you think about that? Um, I, I mean, I regularly pay around five, 600 US for a cover. Um, I don't like paying thousands for a cover, but it's just, if you love a cover, then you're going to pay, you know, for it. So I always go with get the best you can afford, but paying like lots and lots of money for a cover isn't always the best, <laughs> which is you know, kind of convoluted, but yeah. But that's yeah. because you're aware of your, your own budget. So in yes. regards to where, especially where we are career wise, my limit would probably be about, you know, two, three hundred dollars. And there's nothing wrong with that. Whereas you've been around for a lot longer and you can afford to have a larger budget and also you know what you like. And it is on an individual level as to what we're yeah. willing to, you know, budget and things like that. Do you so have you ever paid over a thousand dollars for a cover? Now I'm just curious. I've come close to it. I haven't. But <laughs> I love that cover. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've got a friend who's who's paid well over that amount for covers, but they're brilliant covers, and for her, they were worth it. So yeah, and that's the thing too is, don't buy something that you're not happy with. And I, yes. I know that sounds so silly, but I know a lot of people who they what's the word I'm after? Um, uh. When they'll accept, they'll accept the end piece, but be like, I didn't like this about it, or I wish we could have tweaked that. 
make sure you do it. If you're not happy to look at your cover, then pay yes. the difference for it. If it's another fifty dollars to tweak a font or something, do it. Make sure you're happy. Yeah. yeah. Yep, yep. And one thing I think people have got to remember too is look at the cover at thumb size because that's how readers see it. You know, if you're getting a sample cover, downsize it to a thumb size. How they see it on Amazon and all these sites, does the, does the title stand out? Can you see what the, you know, the, the design is? Can you see the woman on the, on the cover or whatever? Can you see your name? You know, look at it as a reader's going to look at it. Because you want it to pop. People scroll through yeah, that. exactly. Yeah. Yep. So. Is there anything particularly when you're looking for a new cover, um, do you, so say if you're writing, actually, do you get your book covers prior to writing the book or after? Sometimes it's both. Either. <laughs> sometimes I do it after or sometimes I do do it more as before so like the Lizzie Grace series um I've actually got three other covers sitting there waiting for me uh because she uh, she she just had slots available so I, I sort of knew the titles of the books so and we just ran through and got them all done uh, I'm generally not that far advanced uh, and I you know I buy pre-mades that I, I like because you know there's a story there I'm going to tell that one day so yeah I do a bit of both Amazing. I'm finding right now, so I'm currently rebranding a lot of my books. So just in the sense that as it, we were discussing when I had the interview with you, when I look at one of your books, I know that's a Kerry Arthur yep. book. So you stay consistent within your theme and it's yes. a the brand as well. And so I have written multiple genres. I now have 15 books and I'm realizing there's an inconsistency with my cover designs and I've even, you know, not so much a mistake, but uh, my Angel of Demon series, it's such a beautiful cover. I love it. Unfortunately, I'm not with that cover artist anymore. So now I have an entire new series. And the question is, am I going to have to change that one? Because people can tell, as you said, with the Lizzie Gray series, you had to change halfway through. The change is obvious. I think maybe it's not a bad idea to actually know or even sticking to theme, if you're doing a series, keep in mind the other covers as well. And we discussed this vaguely before, but make sure you sort of have a rough idea. If the first book's her being kick-ass with a sword, the next book might be him, you know? So just make sure you have a rough outline and if you yeah. can get them, get them straight away. Yep, yep, yep. And, you know, you might have to change a cover or a title down the, <laughs> down the road, but, you know, that's easy enough done. Um, and it doesn't usually cost much. <laughs> so what's something that you look for in covers? You know, when you're looking at whether it's pre-made or you're looking at people's previous works because you want them to do your custom cover, what are the key elements that you look for to make sure that they can give you the cover that you're after? Covers that look professional, covers that pop, covers that still tell a story without being too crowded, uh, yeah, just covers that are eye-catching at a small size, I think is very important. It's an interesting one. And a lot yeah. of people don't consider this the back of a cover. So we've been talking a lot about the front. What do you think the elements on a back should be? They should echo the front. So if you look at most of mine, the, the, um, the, the background of the, on the front cover is echoed through the back cover. So yeah, yeah, if you've got a spooky forest on the front in the background, then there's a spooky forest on the back. So it echoes, it flows through. Yeah. It does, it has to, not say simple, and I think that's a fantastic concept and I do something very similar. Because yep. when you put your blurb on, you don't want them to be distracted by other elements on no. the back, they need to go straight to the words. Um, yep. And I have seen on some covers, it's like they've tried to get their bang for the buck and they've put too much too much on the back and that's not what the back part is for. No, no. The back part is your blurb. That's, that's you know, you catch them with the, the front and then, then you hook them with the, the back, the blurb. <laughs> that's how we fish, guys. We're going fish. Yeah. <laughs> we spoke about this a little bit before in regards to branding and making sure, and again, I've only become aware of this in the last year, um, but obviously I didn't expect to publish so many books either and make it into a career. 
What yep. is, is there anything in your books? So you have numerous elements, but so people know that it's a Kerry Arthur book. Do you have a certain symbol that you put on the front or is there one element that you make sure that is consistent in every book so that they know it's yours? Uh, if you're talking story-wise, um, all my books are kick-ass heroines. If, if, if you come to my, one of my books, you're going to get a kick-ass heroine with faults, usually addicted to coffee, chocolate or tea. Um, <laughs> or in the Lizzie Grace series. Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> in the Lizzie Grace series, it's cakes. But, um, yeah, but, yeah but everyone knows what to expect from my writing. and and that reflects through to the covers, which is why most of my covers have a kick-ass chick on it. You know, she, she looks fierce, even if she's not carrying a weapon. Like uh, Lizzie Grace never carries a weapon, but she's got the magic in her hand. So what's on my covers reflects what's in the stories. And what yeah. I, so the first book that I ever picked up of yours was Blood Kissed. And so the front, if I'm envisioning this correctly, the front is a woman who's got her head arched back with beautiful long red hair and she's got yeah. the eerie background behind her and a full moon. And yeah. obviously that alone has a lot of elements in it. You know what you're picking up. You know, I knew what yeah. I was in for. So I said yes to that book. What I love about your covers, though, is that usually you do have an eerie sense in the background, but then yes. you have on most of your covers a pop colour as well. So, for example, she was quite pale, but she had this yes. beautiful red hair, and that is what grabbed me straight away and gravita uh, gravi why I gravitated towards that book. Yeah, well, that's it. You, you want your covers to pop, so there's got to be some element that pops in your covers. Uh, with Lucy Grace, it's, it's the red hair. With my fantasy series, most of them, if you look at it, it's um, like Cursed, it's, it's the red armour. With Burn, it's the dragon and the fire. It, it this sort of pops. With Blackbirds, it's actually just the font that pops more than the... You, you notice the font more than... And then you notice the background picture. So, yeah, so you want some element that sort of hooks the eye straight away. Uh, whether it's a collar or the font or something yeah and also uh, maybe we should briefly discuss being conscious of font so oh God, I, yeah. I know so many books that if you have the completely wrong font and there is a certain style in each genre so if you have a romance you're not going to put a horror spook uh, mm. uh theme on it and i don't know maybe like again do your research in the market see what other fonts they have don't don't be crazy and think that this is really going to grab people's attention because it's yeah. going to deter them from it. Yeah, exactly. Fonts are so important. And you said that's the problem with a lot of beginning uh, designers. You'll see this fantastic cover and the font is so wrong. You know, it's just, it's the wrong genre or you downsize it and you can't see it. And, you know, it's just font is so important to a story uh, for a cover. Be aware of it. Again, downsize it. And <laughs> placement's important for a font as well. These are just small mm -hmm. things that, you know, first timers may not be conscious of. And yep. one thing as well that I, I think people should be aware of is if you have credentials, so to speak, such as Kerry. Kerry is a New York Times bestseller. So you have that on your cover. Not all of them, I don't. Really? Is there any reason? Yeah, Liz, Lizzie Grace hasn't got it on her. Really? Yeah, yeah. Why? Yeah. Because it was just too crowded. Okay. It was on, it's on my website, um, but it's, a lot of my self-published books actually haven't got it on it. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, because it's just, well, for me, I've got the name anyway, so I don't need to add that I'm a New York Times bestseller. People recognise my name. I've got the right name recognition, so my name is there. They see that and they go, ah, oh, Kerry, yeah, I know her. So I'm, I'm lucky that way. And I think but, yeah. too, with those, with the, especially the Lizzie ones, there are a lot of elements happening in that. So yes. now that I think about it, it would look crowded with that. So, and yeah. then when I think about other authors who have USA bestseller or things like that, or even some people have, I know I have a mine international bestselling author, but if it's too much, don't, don't rely on that. Obviously, it is another marketing point. But yeah. if it's not working with your cover, don't throw it on anyway. If yeah. you really can see that it's deterring or it's too much, 
take it out. If they already know your work and love your work, they're going to pick it up anyway. Yeah. Yeah, well, see, I've got the three elements already. I've got my name, I've got the uh, the title, and then I've got the series underneath. You try squeezing in a New York Times bestseller line, and it's going to look too crowded. So you've got to think of that too. And the most important on your website, by all means, but you know. <laughs> and the most important parts, are obviously, your name and the title of the book. Exactly. Yep. Yep. They're the, they're the things that matter. What do we do? We say if we get into a contract with a cover artist, whether it be a pre-made cover design, um, which are usually more straightforward because there's less elements to tweak or even to the point of a custom made cover. When we go into a contract with people and we were discussing this briefly in a previous, uh, in our editing technical talk, how should we, obviously we should treat them with respect. And again, it's a professional relationship. But if it's not working for us, if we don't think that one, they may not have the capabilities of what we're trying to envision or put on a cover. So maybe we need to go to somebody with a bit more experience or expertise, or they're just not listening and they're not changing the things that you want. Or even if in yourself, for some reason, you just don't want to work with that or the cover's not working and you want to scrap it and start again, what do we do? You have to talk to the designer. You have to be open and honest. And so, you know, if it's not working, tell her it's not, or him, it's not working. It's, it's like any other business relationship. You've got to talk to them, say, this isn't working for me. What are we going to do? You know, whether you, that's ending the, the relationship, paying them for time done and just scrapping the cover, whatever. Even if you don't like the cover, they have spent time on that cover. So you've got to pay them for the, their time spent. So, well, that's, that's how I view it. I know. Other people have different ideas, but. (laughs) And if we be honest, those people will not make it as far because, you know, your name does get uh, mentioned in in field. So if you do wrong by a specific cover artist, uh, if you go to a next cover artist, more than likely they've probably already spoken because as we do as authors have our, have our network group. So do cover designers, so do editors. There's. Yep. Everyone talks. Yeah. So <laughs> honest and pay. Yeah, yeah. You know, the thing is, you can write it off on tax. You know, it, it's not, it's not money down the drain. Well, it is money down the drain, but at least you can claim it on tax. So, <laughs> what do you think? So, I think not necessarily disputing everything. That's not what I'm going to say. But yeah. if, say, if the graphic designer is actually doing what you think is a bit of a dirty on you. So if you agreed and make sure very upfront, you agree with a set amount, whether it's if you're paying them hourly, it's this amount and ask them to keep a record of how many hours that they're working on it. So if they come up and be like, I worked 70 hours on this cover and you think really, because we've only been working on it for one day and that's 24 hours, just make sure you're keeping them liable as well. Again, it's business. You're hiring out a freelancer or yeah. you know, a company. Um, but what if you don't exactly agree with the quote at the end and that's not you being, um, a tight ass, um, but you genuinely think that they're trying to rip you off in some way. How do you think we should deal with it then? Well, I would, for a start, I would never pay for, by the hour for a cover designer. I would uh, ask upfront what the overall cost is and, you know, fair enough if they want a deposit, pay the deposit. But don't pay the full amount until you get the cover that you're you're happy with. Um, and most designers are perfectly all right that you know with that sort of setup. And that most designers will also tell you up front how many changes you can make to a set uh, work before they will start charging again. So do your research again. You know, uh, be aware of how much you're able to change before it starts costing you and have it set out in writing from the start and you know both of you agreeing again it's a business you've both got to agree to think these things don't go into it blind and then start screaming because it's it's more than you expected to or or whatever because the reality is in any industry there are people that will rip you off yeah hell yeah (laughs) just don't (laughs) Don't be taken advantage of. Be smart in every element and just make sure you're yeah. on the same terms. Whether and or I believe in written agreements, I believe in emails, keeping a trail on it. Yeah. And then that way, worst case scenario, you can, you know, 
bring it up. You can say, actually, this is what you agreed on. You can't really go back on this now. Just make yeah. sure you have that open line of communication and you may have to reconsider as well. If you are working with a cover artist who doesn't have a, if it works for you, it works for you. But if you're really struggling with the lack of communication, this is yeah. a business relationship. Maybe this isn't the artist for you. And there's so many phenomenal artists out there. Just oh yeah. <laughs> well, look at Carrie. Actually, let's all go to Carrie Arthur's cover designer because they are <laughs> amazing. <laughs> I've got three, four, but no. <laughs> cover tart. <laughs> Oh, yeah, pre-made cover chat. <laughs> That's the thing too is I I felt so loyal to my first cover artist for so many years, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the thing yep. is, is my I guess professionalism or where I wanted to take my career out through the expertise that she had, and yep. so I went to pre-made covers and I found other cover designers, and it's okay to have more than one. That's absolutely okay. okay. Yep, yep. Because every story is different and maybe, you know, the cover designer that works for one story is not going to work for the other because they just, they haven't got the expertise to catch those elements. So we've spoken about, I think, almost everything, but is there any, any advice you would offer for budding orders or even current authors? Um, just, is there anything that we've missed? I don't think there is. <laughs> just, if, a, if your book's not selling then more than likely it is the cover that, you know, uh, it, for some, you know, just ch try changing the covers. Most people do and they see an uptick. Um, you ca as I said, the cover is just your shop front. So that's the first thing you've got to look at. And if you change a cover and it's still not selling, then it, it's likely to be the story. <laughs> <laughs> or sometimes the blurb. Make sure you have yeah. the right. Well, yeah. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because currently, as I said before, I'm rebranding at the moment. Yeah. And so my token huntress is my bestseller. It's my vampire dystopian books. And, you know, the sales yeah. are mediocre. The funny thing was is because I've been so hooked on these covers for such a long time. They're very simple. It's just a white wing or a black wing. And I've just changed the colors each time. And the symbol in the middle has evolved every time. So yeah. to me, that was symbolic. And one of my very good friends who, when you have them and they're very honest with you, yeah. uh, said, I love this cover, but I have no idea what the book is about. And I thought that was a massive oversight. And so now I'm redoing the covers. I'm taking yeah. my heart out of it because I'm like, yes. oh, I really like these covers and I'm going to present it with what it actually is. And in theme with the market, which is a kick-ass woman with a weapon on the front, but obviously to my story. So yep. don't be scared to change your covers, but just yep. make sure that you do them right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Be aware of the market. But that, in the end, that's all it comes down to. Well, yep. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on again. You've been amazing as always. That's right. Yeah. Well, hopefully people will find it useful. <laughs> I think they will because the, the reason why I'm starting this is I wish that I had a YouTube channel or something, anything, yeah. To have these conversations because I went into it blind. I know so many other people go into it blind and I made a lot of mistakes. So hopefully yeah. this will prevent a lot of people from wasting time and money as well. Yeah. Hopefully. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> or we're just really bad at what we're discussing. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's valuable, it's valuable. That's all right. Gary, <laughs> well, have a good day and I'll talk to you next time. Yeah. See you next time. Bye. Bye.